from around the globe, it's the Cube, presenting Cube on Cloud. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE. Welcome back to the Cube's special presentation on the future of cloud. You know, three years ago, Alan Nance said to me that in order to really take advantage of cloud and drive billions of dollars of value, you have to change the operating model. I've never forgotten that statement and have explored it from many angles over the last three years. In fact, it was one of the motivations for me actually running this program for our audience. Now, of course, with me is Alan Nance. He's a change agent. He's led transformations at large organizations, including ING Bank, Royal Phillips, Barclays Bank, and many others. He's also a co-founder of Citrus Collab. Alan, great to see you. Thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for having me again, Dave. All right, so when we were preparing for this interview, you shared with me the following. You said enterprise IT often hasn't really tapped the true powers that are available to them to, to make real connections to take advantage of that opportunity, connections to the business that is. What do you mean by that? Well, I think, you know, we, we've been saying for quite a long time that enterprise IT is certainly uh, a big part of our past in technology, but, you know, just how much is it going to be in the future? And, you know, enterprise IT has had a difficult time um, under the cost pressures of being a centralized organization with large expense and large capex, uh, while at the same time uh, we see obviously the digital operations growing, oftentimes in separate uh, reporting structures and closer to the business. And what I'm thinking right now is enterprise IT, if it has made this uh, transition to uh, cloud operating models, whether they are uh, proprietary or whether they are um, public cloud, there's a huge opportunity for enterprise IT to um, connect the dots in a way that no other part of the organization can do that. And when they connect those dots working closely with the business, they unleash a huge amount of value that is beyond uh, things like efficiency or things like, um, like just, just, just providing cloud computing to be flexible. It has to be much more about value generation. And, uh, and I think that a lot of uh, leaders of enterprise IT have not really grasped that. Um, and, and I think that's the opportunity sitting right in front of them right now. You know what I've seen lately, I wonder if you could comment is, you know, obviously we always talk about the stovepipes, but you've, you've seen, you know, the CIO, the chief data officer, that you just mentioned the chief digital officer, the chief information security officer, they've largely been in their own silos. I'm definitely seeing a move to bring those together. I'm seeing a lot of CDOs and, and, and CIO roles come together and even the, the chief information or the head of security reporting up into that where there's, there seems to be, as you're sort of suggesting, just a, a lot more visibility across the entire organization. Is it, is it an organizational issue? Is it a, is it a mindset? I wonder if you could comment. Well, I, I would say it's, it's, it's two or three different things, but certainly it's an organizational issue. But I think it starts off uh, with a cultural issue. And, and I think what you're seeing, and if, if, I, if you look at the more progressive companies that you see, I think you are also seeing a new uh, emergence of the enlightened technology leader. Um, so with all respect to me and my generation, our uh, tenure as the, uh, the owners of uh, the large enterprise IT is coming to an end. And we grew up uh, trying to master the complexity of the, of the uh, silos, as you uh, so deftly uh, pointed out. How we were battling this sprawling technology, trying to get it under control, trying to get the costs down, trying to reduce CapEx. And a lot of that was focused on the partnerships that we had with technology suppliers. And, and so that mindset of being engineers, struggling for control, having your most important partner being the technology company itself, uh, that now I think is giving way. It's giving way to a new generation of technology leaders who haven't grown up with that culture. And uh, oftentimes what I see is that the new enlightened CIOs are female, and they are coming into the role outside of the regular promotion chain. So they're coming to these roles through finance, HR, uh, marketing, 
And they're bringing a different focus. And the focus is much more about how do we work together to create an amazing experience for our employees and for our customers and an experience that drives value. So I think there's a reset in the culture. And clearly, when you start talking about creating a value chain to improve experience, you're also talking about bringing people together from different multidisciplinary backgrounds to make that happen. Well, that's kind of, uh, you know, it makes me think about you know, Amazon's mantra of working backwards, you know, start with the experience. And, and then a lot, of, a lot of CIOs that I know would love to, you know, be more involved in the business, but they're just so busy trying to keep the lights on, like you said, trying to manage vendors and the, and the like. You know, I had a discussion the other day, Alan, with, with an individual, and we were talking about how, you know, you got to shift from a product mindset to a platform mindset. But, you, you know, you've said that, that platform thinking, you're always ahead of the game. Platform thinking, it needs to make way for ecosystem thinking. You know, un unless you're in a giant scale business like Amazon or Spotify, you said, you're going to be in a niche market if you really don't tap that ecosystem. Again, if you could explain what you mean by that. Well, I think right now, if, if, if this movement to experience is fundamental, right? So uh, Joe Pine and Jim Gilmore wrote about the experience economy as far back in 1990. But the things that they predicted then are here now. And so what we're now seeing is that consumers have choice, employees have choice. Um, I think the pandemic has accelerated that. And so what happens when you when you when you put an enterprise under that type of uh, external pressure is that it fragments and it, and it can fragment in two ways. It can fragment dysfunctionally so that every silo tries to go into a, uh, a defensive mode, a uh, protective mode. Uh, that's obviously the wrong way to go. But the fragmentation that's exciting is when it fragments into ecosystems that are actually working together to solve an experience problem. And those are not platforms. They're too big. You know, uh, when I was at Philips, I was very enthusiastic about working on this uh, connected healthcare platform. But I think what I started to realize was it takes too much time. It requires too much investment. And you are bringing people to you based on your capability. Whereas what the market needs is much more agile than that. So if we look in healthcare, for instance, and you want to connect um, patients at home with patient with the doctors in the hospital. In the old model, you say, I'm going to build a platform for this. And I'm going to have doctors with a certain uh, competence and they're going to be connecting into this. And so are the uh, patients in some way. And so are the insurers. I think what you're going to see now is, is different. We're going to say, let's get together a small team that understands its competence. So for instance, let's get a, an insurance provider, let's get a healthcare operator, let's get a healthcare tech company, and let's pool their data in a way that helps us to create solutions now that, that can roll out in 30, 60, or 90 days. And, and the thing that, that makes that possible is the move to the public cloud because now there are so many specialized uh, suppliers, specialized skill sets available that you can connect to through Amazon, through uh, Google, through, through Azure, that, that these, these things that we used to, I don't know, think were very, very difficult are now much easier. I don't want to minimize the effort, um, but these, these things are on the table right now to, uh, to reap value. So you're also a technologist and I, I want to ask you, and, and everybody always says it's the technology is the easy part. It's the people and the process and you know, we, all, we can all agree on that. However, sometimes technology can be a blocker and the example that you just mentioned, I have a couple of takeaways from that. First of all, you know, the platform thinking is somewhat, sounds like it's more command and control and you're advocating for, let's get the ecosystem who are closest to the problem to solve those problems, however they decide and now leverage the cloud. So my question is from a technology standpoint, does that ecosystem have to be in the same cloud with the state of today's technology? Can it be across clouds? Can be there pieces on-prem? What's your thinking on that? I think, I think ex exactly the opposite. It cannot be monolithic and centralized. It's just not practical because that would, that would, that would cause you too much time on interoperability and who owns what. You see, the, the, the power behind experience is data. 
And so the, the most important technical part of this is dealing with data liquidity. So the data that, for instance, um, uh, somebody like um, Kaiser has, or the, 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 the Harvard uh, Healthcare have, or the Philips have, that's not going to be put into a central place. But for the ecosystem mobilization, there will be subsets of that data flowing between those parties. So the technical, the hard bit, is how do we manage data liquidity? How do we manage the security around uh, data liquidity? And how do we also understand that what we're building is going to be ever-changing and maybe temporary because an idea may not work? Um, and so you've got this idea that the timeliness is, is very, very important. The duration is very uncertain. The, the motor, the energy for this is, is data liquidity, data transfer, data sharing. But the, the vehicle is, is the combination of public cloud, in my mind. Somebody said to me the other day that you know, data is like water. It'll go. It'll go where it wants to go, where it needs to go. You can't try to control it. It's let it go. Uh, and, now, of course, many organizations, particularly large incumbent organizations, they they have many, many data pipelines. They have many processes, many roles, and they're, and they're struggling to actually kind of inject automation in, into those pipelines. Uh, maybe that's machine intelligence. Uh, really do more data sharing across that pipeline and, and ultimately compress the end-to-end -end cycle time to go from raw data to insights that are actionable. What are you seeing there and what's your advice? Well, I think the, the, the you make some really good points. But what I hear also a little bit in your observation is you're still observing enterprises. And the, ent the focus of the enterprise has been on um, optimizing the processes within the boundaries of its own system. That's why we have SAP and that's why we have a Salesforce and, and to some degree even ServiceNow. It's all been about optimizing how we move data, how we create products and services. And, and that's not the game now. That's not an important game. The important game right now is how do I connect to my employees? How do I connect to my customers in a way that provides them a memorable experience? And the realization is, and we've seen this already in manufacturing for some years, I can't be all things to all people. So I have to understand, this is where the first part of data comes in, I have to understand who this person is that I'm trying to target. Who is the person that needs this memorable experience? And what is that memorable experience going to look like? And I'm going to need my data, but I'm also going to need the data of other actors in that ecosystem. And then I'm going to have to build that ecosystem really quickly to take advantage of the system. So this throws a monkey wrench in traditional ideas of standardization. It throws a monkey wrench in the idea that enterprise IT is about efficiency. Um, and and, and if, if I may, I just want to come back to the AI because I think we're looking in the wrong places for things like AI. And let me give you an example. Uh, today, there are 2.2 million people working in call centers around the world. If we imagine that they work in three shifts, that means at any one time, there are 700,000 people uh, on the phone to a customer. And that customer is calling that company because they're vested. They're calling them with advice. They're calling them with a question. They're calling them with a complaint. It is the most important source of valuable data that any company has. And yet, what have we done with that? What we've done with that is we've attacked it with efficiency. So instead of saying, these are the most valuable sources of information, let's use uh, AI to, um, to tag the sentiment in the recordings that we make with our most valuable stakeholders, and let's analyze them for trends, ideas, uh, things that need to change. We don't do that. What we do is we're going to give every call agent two minutes to get them off the phone. For God's sake, don't ask them any important, difficult questions. Don't spend money talking to the customer. Uh, try to make them happy so you, they get a score and say they'd uh, hire you at the end of the call, and then you're done. So, so where the AI and the automation needs to come in is not in improving efficiency, but in mining value. And the, the, the real opportunity with AI is that 
uh, and Joe Pine says this, if you are able to understand a customer rather than interpret them, that is so valuable to the customer that they will pay money for that. And I think that's where the whole focus needs to be in this new teaming of enterprise IT and digital in the business. Some great observations. I think we can all relate to that. Your call center example, or you've, you've been at a restaurant and you're trying to turn the tables fast and get you out of there. And it's the last time you ever go to that restaurant. And you're, you're taking that notion of systems thinking and, and broadening it to ecosystems thinking. And you've said ecosystems have a better chance of success when they're used to stage an experience for whether it's the employee, for the brand, and of course, you know, the customer and the partners. I, I, that's it, that's exactly it. So every uh, technology leader should be asking themselves, uh, what contribution can, can I and my organization make to this movement? Because the business, understands the problem. They don't understand how to solve it. And we've chosen a different dialogue. So we've been talking a lot about what cloud can do and the, the functionality that cloud has and the potential that cloud has. And those are all good things. But it really comes together now when we work together and we as the technology group brings in the know-how, we know how to connect quickly through the public cloud. We know how to do that in a secure way. We know how to manage data liquidity at scale. And we can stand these things up through our, uh, you know, our new learning of Agile and DevOps. We can stand these ecosystems up fairly quickly uh, now, there's still a whole bunch of culture between different businesses that have to work together. Uh, the, the idea that I have to protect my data rather than serve the customer. But once you get past that, there's a whole new conversation that enterprise IT can have that I think gives them a new lease of life, new value. And I, I just think it's a really, really exciting time. Yeah, so you, you see the intersection of a lot of different things. You, you talk about cloud as you know, an enabler for sure. And that's great, we can talk about that. But you've got this, what you were referring to before is you know, maybe you're in a, a, a niche market, but you have your marketplace. And like you're saying, you can actually use that through an ecosystem to really lever a much, much broader available market and then vector that into the experience economy. You know, we talk about subscriptions, the API economy, that, that really is new thinking. It is, and I, and I think what you're seeing here is is it's 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 not radical in as much as all of these ideas have been around. Some of them have been around since the 90s, but what's radical is the the way in which we can now mix and match these technologies to make this happen. Uh, that's gone so quickly, and I would argue to you, and I've argued this before, scale scale is a concept within an organization and is dead. It, it doesn't give you enough value. It gives you enough efficiency and it gives you a clout, but it doesn't give you uh, the opportunity to target uh, the niche experiences that you need to do. So if we start to think of an organization as a, um, a combination of known and unknown potential ecosystems, you start to build a different operating model, a different architectural idea. Uh, you start to look outside more than you start to look inside, which is why the cultural change that we were talking about just now goes hand in hand with this, because people have to be comfortable thinking in ecosystems that may not yet exist and partnering with people where they bring to the table their you know, 20, 30 years of experience in a new and different way. So let me make sure I understand that. So you basically, if I understand it, you're saying that if you're, sort of end goal is scale and efficiency at scale, you, you're, you're going to have a vanilla solution for your customers and your ecosystem. Whereas if you I, allow this outside in thinking to come in, you're going to be able to actually customize those experience, experiences and get the value of scale and efficiency. Right. So, I mean, Rory Sutherland, who is a, a, a big thinker in the, in the marketing world, has always said, uh, ultimately, scale, standardization, and best practice lead to mediocrity. Because you are not focused on the most important thing for your employee or your brand or your, you're focused on the, the efficiency factors and they create very little value. In fact, we know that they subvert value. So yes, we need to have a very big mindset change. 
Yeah, you're a top line <laughs> thinker, Alan, and, and always at the forefront. I really appreciate you coming on to the, to the Cube and participating in this program. Give us a last word. So if you're a change agent, I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm an organization and I want to inject this type of change. Where do I start? Well, I think it starts by identifying, are we going to, um, is it, are we going to work on the employee experience? Do we feel that we have a model where the employees that are on stage with customers are so important that the focus has to be employees? We go down that route, then we look at what's happened to the pandemic. What type of experiences are we going to bring to those employees around their ability to have flow in their work, to get return on energy, to excite the customers? Let's do that. Let's figure out what experience are we driving now and what does that experience need to be? If we're on the customer side, as I said, let's look at all the sources of information that we already have. You know, I know companies that spend hundreds of millions a year trying to figure out what consumers want. And yet, if we look in their call centers, you will call up and, and they will say to you, your call may be recorded for quality purposes and training. And it's not true. Less than 10% of those calls are ever listened to. And if they are listened to, it's compliance that's driving that not the burning desire to better understand the consumer. So if we change that, then we say, okay, so what can we change? What is the experience that we are now able to stage with all we know and with all we can do? And, and let's start there. Let's start with what is the experience you want to stage? What's the experience landscape look like now? And who do we bring together to make that happen? Alan, fantastic <laughs> having you back in theCUBE. It's always a pleasure. And, uh, and thanks so much for participating. Thank you, Dave. It's always a pleasure to, to speak with you. And thank you, everybody. This is Dave Vellante, theCUBE on Cloud. We'll be right back right after this short break. Stay with us.